look at the uh, syllabus, uh, notice that we're reading about something other than development, uh, and uh, came to the conclusion that we were supposed to read the previous chapter. Uh, I hope that didn't cause too much confusion. Uh, what I will do uh, is uh, that I'm going to uh, later uh, tomorrow or over the weekend in any event uh, post uh, a revised reading list uh, for the remainder of the course uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, and that nobody is too confused. Uh, and that will be on portal uh, by the end of the weekend. Uh, so do take a look at that. Uh, and next week, as I said, we will be uh, dealing with human rights issues uh, as well as with international law. Uh, so I do encourage you to uh, do the relevant readings uh, for that. Um, I think that's all uh, in the nature of uh, more uh, general material. Yeah. Uh, chapter of international law. Pardon? Chapter 11. Chapter 11 of international law is in the second edition. But not in the third, not in the new edition. Isn't the second edition? No, no, there's a, a newer edition of that. The third edition, <laughs> that's the problem, yeah. Uh, what? So again, I, I apologize for that. Uh, generally, when they come out with new editions, the chapter outlines are more or less the same as the previous uh, edition, and they only add new examples and things along those lines. Uh, this time, they uh, seem to have fairly significantly restructured the text. Uh, I hope that won't affect us too much, however. Uh, I also want to do, uh, well, let me first, uh, before I uh, say anything else, see if there's any other quick questions or comments about anything that, we, that was related to the class. Uh, you probably can't remember back that far since you know, we've had our reading week uh, last week uh, and I hope all of you got plenty of reading done uh, for uh, another form of uh, rest and relaxation and are back in full force uh, today. Uh, before I get into today's topic, which is uh, development and north-south uh, dynamics in international uh, politics, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things very briefly uh, about events that have occurred in the last uh, two weeks since, since our last meeting. Uh, that I think uh, are important to address uh, in a course on international politics. In particular, uh, we've uh, mentioned on a few occasions previously uh, the conflict that has been going on uh, in Ukraine uh, and that has taken on uh, rather more ominous uh, forms uh, in the last uh, few days. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the Western media in general uh, and uh, newspapers and, uh, and uh, uh, news programs and so on have not done a particularly good job uh, of uh, explaining uh, what's going on in the Ukraine uh, and have, um, as some would argue, uh, uh, perhaps more strongly than I would, uh, functioned essentially as, um, as a kind of propaganda tool of, of Western governments uh, that are very clearly trying to wrest uh, the Ukraine away from Russia uh, and uh, into the Western uh, sphere of influence. And, uh, of course, uh, that there may not be anything particularly wrong with that. Uh, however, uh, in the current context, there is something uh, slightly wrong with that. Um, the first thing is uh, that uh, the Ukraine uh, is a region of uh, Central Europe, or Eastern Europe, rather, uh, that is of crucial importance uh, to uh, the Russian Federation and has been throughout much of its history. Uh, the Ukraine has been part of uh, Russia uh, for over 200 years, uh, in other words, long before the Soviet Union. Uh, and a sizable portion of the Ukraine uh, is Russian-speaking uh, and was integrated into the Ukraine, not because it was part of Ukraine uh, originally uh, or because its people spoke Ukrainian, uh, but rather because uh, Joseph Stalin uh, wanted to Russify uh, the non-Russian areas uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, including Georgia, including Ukraine, uh, including uh, the, uh, the various uh, uh, Central Asian uh, republics, uh, and uh, did so by encouraging uh, extensive migration within the uh, Soviet Union, uh, in other words, of uh, those living in regions that were non-Russian into Russia proper, and of Russians uh, into regions that were non-Russian. Uh, in order to create a more homogenous Soviet citizenship and Soviet national identity rather than these lingering uh, national identities associated with different uh, regions. Uh, in the case of the Ukraine, uh, that took the form not so much of massive immigration, uh, but rather of integrating regions that were formerly part of Russia proper, uh, like the Crimea, uh, into, uh, into the Ukrainian uh, Republic. Uh, since they were all part of the Soviet Union, it really didn't make any difference. Uh, it was really a matter of drawing lines in different places. Uh, and uh, it was merely administratively important, uh, but did not have much of an impact uh, on Soviet politics. However, when Ukraine gained its independence, 
uh, it gained its independence as uh, the unit that was created under the Soviet Union, meaning including those Russian-speaking regions in the eastern part of the Ukraine, and include, uh, including uh, uh, the Crimea. Um, and that's of uh, some importance, uh, in part uh, by virtue of the fact uh, that it demonstrates that the Ukraine uh, is not entirely a single country, despite the fact that most of the population, even the Russian population of the Ukraine, uh, has in the public opinion polls in uh, the, the last few months uh, voiced their preference for staying as a unified entity within the Ukraine. Uh, but that can change rather, ra rather drastically and rather quickly, uh, depending on what actually happens in the Ukraine. It may already be changing rather drastically. Uh, the other side of it is that uh, the uh, Crimea uh, was a very important region for uh, the uh, Soviet government uh, and continues to be a very important region for the Russian government uh, militarily. Much of the military infrastructure of the Soviet Union was located uh, in parts of the Ukraine, in particular in the eastern parts of the Ukraine, and the biggest uh, Black Sea naval uh, base, uh, the home of the Black, uh, Black Sea uh, uh, fleet uh, of the Russian uh, Federation, uh, continues to be uh, stationed in the Crimea, continues to be stationed uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, that's obviously something that can't remain the case if the Ukraine is going to become entirely independent uh, of, of Russia. Uh, and it's also something that certainly uh, means that Russia has a strong interest in whatever happens uh, within the Ukraine. Now beyond that, um, as many of you are probably aware, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed and disintegrated, uh, and the economic model upon which it was based disintegrated with it, uh, meaning uh, socialism or communism or whatever title you want to use, uh, the changes that brought about Russia, the Russian Federation and the Ukraine <coughs> Uh, were first and foremost uh, the creation of a capitalist economy. Uh, now, the important thing to remember up, uh, in that context is that within the Soviet Union, there was no such thing as private property. Everything was state-owned. All land was state-owned, all and industries were state-owned, all installations of any sort uh, were state-owned. And the question that arose, well, how do you turn a economy that's entirely state-owned into a capitalist economy? Uh, and essentially, uh, what that boils down to is that under the government of Boris Yeltsin uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, or in what now is Russia, uh, the process of privatization uh, took on uh, rather corrupt forms, uh, meaning that those that were well connected uh, politically uh, ended up uh, taking over uh, major state owned operations and becoming, in essence, uh, what uh, is now referred to both in the context of the Ukraine uh, as well as in the context of Russia, uh, the oligarchs, uh, a handful of very wealthy people uh, that benefited from their political connections in being able to take over major state-owned uh, industries. And this process was pretty much the same in the Ukraine as it was in Russia. In the Ukraine, it hadn't had a wrinkle to it, though. Uh, the Ukrainian oligarchs, for the most part, uh, to a greater extent than the, their Russian counterparts, although their Russian counterparts certainly were guilty of much of this as well, uh, were fearful uh, about the security of their newfound wealth, uh, in part because of the illegitimate, the illegitimate nature through which they got that wealth. Uh, and uh, if you were a Russian or a Ukrainian oligarch who suddenly uh, came into an enormous amount of wealth uh, that was only uh, that you got through dubious means and that uh, many within your own society might challenge your ownership of, uh, what would you be inclined to do with that wealth? Well, the overwhelming response of most of those oligarchs is get as much of that out of the country as possible uh, and deposit it in outside of the country. So if the political winds change within Russia, the Russian Federation or within the Ukraine, you've got your wealth stashed elsewhere. Uh, and uh, hopefully also have um, uh, exit visas and all of that kind of stuff ready to go in case you have to leave with them. Uh, and that meant that an awful lot of the wealth uh, in the Ukraine uh, ended up in private bank accounts in Western economies. Uh, Yanukovych and practically all of the, of the elite that run the Ukraine benefited to a considerable extent from that. Uh, and this is as much the case of Yanukovych uh, as of uh, pardon me, of Yulia Tymoshenko, uh, the op current opposition leader, uh, as it was of Yanukovych. Uh, there's plenty of corruption to go around uh, in the Ukraine, uh, and uh, uh, Yanukovych certainly was not a good guy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, uh, and there are very few good guys, uh, at least at the top uh, levels of Ukrainian politics. Uh, suffice it to say, however, uh, that uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
uh, the Western powers, in particular the United States, have, as some would more stridently than perhaps I would, uh, suggested, uh, that there has been a continuation of the Cold War, but merely a one-sided continuation of the Cold War, meaning that the Russians gave up, but NATO certainly has not. Uh, and the most immediate uh, indication thereof is that uh, with the end of the Cold War, the Warsaw Treaty our organization collapsed. And many argue that since the very purpose of NATO was to protect Europe from a Soviet invasion by the Warsaw, Warsaw Treaty organization, that NATO should likewise have disintegrated. Uh, but of course it didn't. Uh, and the first proposals about NATO uh, and the continuing existence of NATO uh, that took place uh, in the context of uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, was between Mikhail Gorbachev and George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, and it took place at the time of the reunification of Germany. Uh, uh, Gorbachev, at the time that this came up as a possibility, suggested, perhaps somewhat reasonably, uh, that he would not oppose a reunification of Germany uh, so long as Germany uh, was no longer part of NATO, uh, and uh, would, it would also permit East Germany to leave the Warsaw Treaty back so long as it did not become part of NATO. Uh, this proposal was rejected by uh, Western powers, uh, by West Germany in particular, uh, but also by George Herbert Walker Bush, who was president at the time. Uh, he suggested uh, instead uh, that Germany be allowed to reunify uh, under the control of NATO, uh, but that in turn he would promise that NATO would not would move one inch further east than the eastern border of, uh, of East Germany. And that promise, unfortunately, uh, Gorbachev never got in writing. Uh, and uh, lasted about as long as the uh, Bush presidency, uh, meaning that uh, immediately after Bush uh, ceased to be the president and was replaced by Clinton, uh, essentially the United States pursued a policy, along with its European partners, of pushing NATO further eastward, uh, including, uh, in the meantime, essentially all of, Eastern Europe, all of the Eastern European states that were part of the uh, Soviet sphere of influence, but also um, including regions uh, that were previously part of the Soviet Union itself, uh, such as Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and so on. Uh, and uh, many argue, uh, many realists in particular argue, that sooner or later, uh, this was going to make the Russians very, very paranoid. In other words, one of the reasons why Stalin insisted that Eastern, Eastern Europe be part of his, his sphere of influence was because of the long historical fear of Russia. Uh, of its western neighbors and of its weakly protected borders uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, the Ukraine uh, was certainly a component of that buffer zone uh, that uh, the Russian uh, state uh, has tried to maintain with regard to uh, Western Europe throughout much of its history. Uh, and uh, the Ukraine, of course, suffered rather severely as a result of uh, the, these policies, both under Tsarist Russia, but most specifically, uh, under Stalin's uh, Russia. Uh, under Stalin, uh, the Ukraine was forcibly integrated into the Soviet Union. Uh, it was subjected to essentially what historians have described as a man-made famine, uh, in which millions of Ukrainians were starved to death uh, in the process of collectivizing agriculture in the region and so on. Uh, and given uh, that record in the 1920s and 1930s, it's not too surprising uh, that many Ukrainians uh, viewed the Nazi German forces as they entered the Ukraine as liberating forces and to a large extent collaborated with them. And as those of you familiar with, West, with European history are, uh, are probably aware, some of the most horrendous uh, human rights violations, including parts of the, uh, of the Holocaust, took place on Ukrainian soil um, and were targeted at Jews uh, and as, as well at, uh, at Russians and Russian speakers. Uh, that were slaughtered uh, wholesale uh, by the Nazis and their local collaborators. Um, the Soviet Union, of course, liberated the Ukraine uh, from the Nazi, uh, uh, Nazi occupation. Uh, and in the process, uh, many uh, of the uh, fighters were seen as heroes uh, for liberating uh, Ukraine uh, from the Nazis. Uh, there, are, there are statues all over the Ukraine uh, commemorating the heroes of the anti-Nazi struggle and so on. Uh, but the triumph of the Soviet Union over the Nazis left a lot of the Ukrainian pop uh, population less than enthusiastic, uh, given its previous experience. Uh, and that means that, in particular, uh, there is a division within the U Ukraine between the East and West, uh, the East being somewhat more favorable toward the, uh, toward the Russian government, and the West uh, generally being more favorable uh, toward uh, Euro Europeans uh, and perhaps Germans. Um, all of that uh, creates a somewhat explosive uh, situation uh, for the Ukraine today. 
But what seems to be fairly evident is that uh, as uh, the government of Yanukovych uh, started to experience problems, uh, the Russian government continuously argued uh, that these problems were the result of Western meddling, uh, that Western countries were trying to undermine a relatively Russian-friendly government uh, in Kiev, first in the Orange Revolution of 2005, and subsequently to that. Uh, and indeed, there's a great deal of evidence that that's in fact the case. Uh, in the case of the Orange Revolution, uh, there were extensive uh, operations uh, by non-governmental organizations, uh, as well as uh, organizations tied to the American government, uh, like the National Endowment for Democracy and so on, uh, that were active in uh, funneling resources to protesters and so on. Uh, last November, uh, Victoria Nuland uh, gave a, a speech uh, in which uh, she bragged about that uh, the State Department and the U.S. government as a whole had spent, or had invested, as she put it, $5 billion in democracy promotion uh, 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 activities in the Ukraine. And $5 billion buys a lot of money, buys a lot of uh, things uh, in the Ukraine, uh, it being a relatively poor country. Um, More recently, uh, it's come to my attention uh, that um, a number of the oligarchs, uh, in particular uh, one oligarch whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, who owns the most popular uh, soccer team uh, in uh, Ukraine, um, received a visit uh, from Victoria Newland uh, last December, uh, in which uh, he, was, uh, he was warned uh, that uh, the oligarchs, of which he is a representative, uh, should be very careful uh, because uh, she was predicting that uh, as uh, the uh, Yanukovych government was about to reject a, uh, a uh, agreement with the European Union, uh, that there would be protests. And if these protests were put down forcibly by the government, uh, that uh, the West uh, would, in the United States in particular, but uh, in cooperation with Europe, would impose sanctions. And that the first sanctions would be sanctions that would freeze all the international assets that belong to any Ukrainians. Uh, meaning the oligarchs had every worry about uh, what would happen uh, and it would affect their wealth personally. And furthermore, uh, they to a large extent owned uh, the government of uh, Yanukovych, uh, meaning they could put pressure on Yanukovych not to put down the, uh, the demonstrations. And this is, uh, if you've been watching what's been happening in the Ukraine, one of the things that has been most puzzling is why after uh, you know the protests started back in November fairly peacefully, uh, but they started taking on much more ominous tones and much more violent tones uh, by, by early December, uh, and uh, tones that in any other democratic uh, uh, country would have resulted in those uh, demonstrations being ended uh, almost immediately. Think of what Mr. Harper would have done if those kinds of demonstrations with people throwing bricks at police uh, and Molotov cocktails uh, would have done uh, in that situation, uh, given how Canada reacted to rather mild uh, protests in officially designated protest zones in the part uh, in the last uh, G, uh, G8 uh, meeting uh, in Toronto. Um, well, this explains why he never put down those, uh, those protests. Essentially, all of the oligarchs were saying, if you put down those protests, all of our, our assets going to be seized uh, by, uh, by uh, the uh, in uh, foreign countries, and we'll be out of luck. Um, now, Beyond that, uh, the uh, evidence seems to point uh, to that uh, the, um, the American government was indeed very extensively involved, not only in the protests, uh, which were heavily funded uh, by uh, the American government. Victoria Newland, uh, the Under Secretary of State uh, in the United States, was actually handing out cookies uh, in um, American Square uh, throughout much of the earlier parts of the protest. Uh, but I've read numerous reports of uh, people that claim to have been paid directly for their participation in the protests. Uh, by the American government. Um, I, that's hard to verify. Suffice it to say, however, the protests were not put down. Uh, the protests eventually took on a more and more violent form, uh, eventually uh, resulting in the uh, security forces of the Ukrainian government pulling back, uh, whereupon uh, the parliament buildings were, uh, were attacked, uh, whereupon all of the members of the ruling party, uh, the party of Yanukovych, uh, fearing for their lives, escaped from the parliament building leaving only the rump opposition uh, that represented less than, uh, far less than the majority of the parliament uh, in the parliament, which then voted to, uh, to impeach Yanukovych uh, and to create an interim government. Now, the problem with that is that Yanukovych, and believe me, I don't think Yanukovych is a great guy uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but he did win a solid majority and fair free elections, uh, gauged to be so by international observers, 
four years ago, that was to last until 2015. Um, he was disposed in, therefore, in what essentially amounted to a coup. Not a military coup, but a coup nonetheless, in that his removal was not done in accordance to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, existing constitution. The existing constitution would have required some kind of investigation, some kind of accusations, and for those accusations to be, ga to be gauged uh, by uh, the uh, court system uh, in the Ukraine in order to impeach him. Um, and that means essentially this impeachment uh, is, at least technically in accordance to the constitution, illegal. And he is absolutely right to claim that he is still the elected president uh, of the Ukraine. But in the meantime, there's a different parliament, and there's an interim president that's been elected by this rump coalition uh, of, uh, of uh, the opposition movement, uh, which represents less than a majority of the population, uh, or at least uh, there is no clear indication that uh, uh, how much of a uh, how much it represents uh, the population as a whole. And uh, that means that to some extent, uh, the current authorities in the Ukraine lack authority. Uh, lack real legitimacy. Now what's worse in that regard is that one of the first measures that this new, new uh, parliament uh, took uh, was a diktat uh, that henceforth all public business take place in the Ukrainian language, not in the Russian language. Meaning they're essentially attacking the language rights of Russian minorities. Uh, and this is something that is highly problematic. Uh, on the whole, uh, I don't think that the uh, Russian government is particularly inclined uh, toward an invasion of the Ukraine. However, uh, if a sizable portion of the Ukrainian pop population feels that their, uh, their rights are being threatened uh, by uh, this uh, new, more right-wing government, uh, more nationalist Ukrainian government, uh, it is virtually unthinkable uh, that they would not interfere in some way, shape, or form. And the way that they could interfere is, on the one hand, to support groups that are already calling for Russian intervention in the Crimea, uh, that are absolutely opposed to uh, staying within a Ukrainian-dominated uh, Ukraine, uh, and therefore uh, lead to the partition of Ukraine, uh, and uh, consequently the drawing up of a kind of an iron curtain right through the center of Ukraine and right on the border of modern Russia, uh, which not, would not be a very uh, stable situation. Or uh, the other possibility is that uh, they march in and take over the Ukraine as a whole. Uh, either proposition is hopefully not very likely, uh, but is looking more and more likely as uh, things proceed. Um, what would be the, the real question is what would be the reaction of the West if this were to happen? Uh, and on a much smaller scale, uh, this already played itself out uh, in 2008 in the country of Georgia, uh, in which likewise uh, the uh, Western powers interfered uh, to create a protest movement to overthrow a pro-Russian uh, uh, government, replace it with uh, President Saakashvili, uh, who was seen as a Western puppet, uh, who very quickly took actions to suppress the rights of Russian minorities living in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, two smaller provinces on the border with Russia, uh, which in turn meant uh, that the Russians marched in and severed those sections uh, from, uh, from Georgia. Uh, Georgia at the time had an application to become a member of NATO, had it already been accepted for membership in NATO, NATO would have been treaty bound to come to the defense of uh, Georgia. And you would essentially have had a uh, superpower confrontation between uh, Western powers and Russia. Uh, Georgia is relatively insignificant in the scheme of things. Uh, Ukraine is far, far more significant uh, for all sorts of reasons uh, that I don't have the full uh, time to go into without uh, taking up the rest of our lecture today. Uh, but basically what we're looking at at this point uh, is the very real possibility uh, that the Soviet uh, government, or rather the Russian government of Vladimir Putin, uh, will feel compelled to inter in uh, intervene in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, and uh, then the question becomes, uh, what would be the response of Western powers uh, that have taken this whole thing on, and that have strongly supported, rhetorically and otherwise, uh, the uh, legitimacy of the current government? Uh, if they simply let the Russians take over, uh, they blow their credibility. No one will ever trust their word in terms of their security uh, guarantees uh, ever again uh, if uh, after uh, creating this kind of a situation in Ukraine, uh, they simply leave uh, the Ukraine uh, to be taken back by the Russians. And that means that that kind of a dynamic, which is also the dynamic that pushed the United States into Vietnam, as you might recall, uh, the idea that if we don't protect South Vietnam from the Russians, uh, then no one will ever believe us uh, and uh, everyone will try to develop their own nuclear capacities and so on and so forth. Therefore, we must go in, uh, even if we don't have any strategic uh, uh, interest in that region and so on. The same dynamic could very well replay itself uh, in uh, the current context uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, 
Uh, and in this case, it wouldn't be in the backwater in uh, Southeast Asia. It would be right in the center of Europe uh, and could very quickly spread from that. And of course, uh, as most of you are well aware, if you've been paying attention, uh, the, so the, the Russian government and uh, the, the uh, uh, and the Western powers uh, still have a plenty, uh, plentiful supply of nuclear weapons uh, with which to essentially destroy life on Earth as we know it. Uh, meaning uh, that we all have a stake in this. Uh, and at the moment, it seems uh, very much like uh, the Western powers as well as the, uh, the general powers are sleepwalking into a war, uh, somewhat like the uh, like Europeans sleep, sleepwalk their way into World War I. No one really ever intended that war to take place. Uh, but uh, one thing led to another, and a whole series of uh, dumb decisions in hindsight uh, led to uh, a horrible conflagration uh, that came close to 